how many great minds through history have really wrestled with that story. What kind of God is this? God does not want us to kill yeah. children in sacrifice to him or for any other reason. But he did want Abraham to come to that point of decision, I'll give you even this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing will come between me and you. Yeah, the genealogy of, of Jesus is, it reads like a, a soap opera, if you know the, the stories behind the names. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at WalletWin, Catholic financial formation for the whole family. To learn more, visit WalletWin.com. That's Wallet, W-I-N, dot com. Today we're going to be looking at the patriarchs, and boy, you're in for a great show because we have a phenomenal guest. Dr. Mary Healy is going to be with us in just a, a few minutes, and we're going to delve into the patriarchs, a little bit about Abraham, Isaac, really going to focus on Jacob because, you know, of all of the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, also Joseph, there is a lot. There's a lot on Jacob, and there's some questions that I'm sure you're going to have about Jacob and his brother Esau getting the blessing and the birthright, and is that really right? Does that really work? We're going to talk about that. Dr. Mary Healy, it's good to have you. Thanks. Good to be with you, John. Yeah. I would not have imagined that uh, years ago when we were working together and you were really going through every, literally all 24 lessons of yeah, the great adventure. Yeah. With the red pen. Yes. It was bleeding oh, by then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I hope you don't have copies of that. <laughs> but you were so helpful, you know, in, in just, uh, you know, making sure that you're sticking with the church, you know, accurate. And no better person could have done that. You not only are a Bible scholar, but you're on the Pontifical Biblical Commission. And I don't even know what that means. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I want to I know, you know, what is that? What is the Pontifical Biblical Commission? Uh, well, nobody was more surprised than I was mm -hmm. when I found out that I was appointed to it. Um, it's 20 biblical scholars from around the world mm -hmm. who, um, who meet once a year for a week in the Vatican. And um, our role is to advise the church on biblical matters. But typically we take one theme and we study that theme for five years. And we write a document together at the mm -hmm. well throughout um, that five year session, yep. and we present it to the Pope, and he then decides whether it will be published. Generally, they are published. Mm -hmm. And right now, our topic is sickness and suffering in the Bible. Wow! Oh, that's good. Your suffering is such a. It is so. It's so central to life. So many people are suffering, and you know we have to know what to do with suffering. But we also believe that God heals too. Amen. You know. Yeah, can't talk about sickness without talking about healing. Right. Bible. You know, there's a, I guess a, a process that people go through as kids. They grow up, and unfortunately, a, a child at times, and the parents will read the Bible to him, and a child will will put the Bible right in the same pot with uh, Hans Christian Andersen and all these mm -hmm. stories and Hansel and Gretel and so forth. But then when they grow up, they still sort of look at the Bible that way and not yeah. as yeah. a word from God that would change your life and it's God's plan for your life. Big difference between Genesis, which we're going to look at today, and Hansel and Gretel. Absolutely. You know, huge difference. <laughs> Fact there. versus fiction. Yeah, right, right. So I also wanted to uh, to ask you about your commentary because one of the one of the questions that I get, probably in the top five questions, do you have a commentary that you can recommend, Jeff? Because so many people that have gone through the great adventure, Bible study, want to go deeper. Mm -hmm. They want to know, are there more tools out there for me? Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to announce, yes, there is. There's a phenomenal uh, Catholic biblical commentary introduces mm -hmm. to it. Well, um, yeah, it just so happens that I, I, I do know of a commentary series. <laughs> it's called The Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. I'm one of the co-editors, mm -hmm. as you know. And we have completed the New Testament. So it's 17 volumes in all to cover the entire New Testament. And we're starting the Old now. And I'm working on the book of Genesis, which is so much fun. And um, we unpack the biblical text passage by passage. We break it open. And we also explain what the church has said about it, if there's any church teaching related to it, what saints have said about it, fathers of the church, and how to apply it mm -hmm. to our life. I mean, this is not just academic interest. Yeah. Well, this is the living word from God. So it's written from faith, from a perspective. Of that's faith. what I was going to say is I, I like it so much is that it's not like a, a dead book. 
Mm-mm. It's alive. And you are teaching and you're giving a commentary on a book that is alive. It, in fact, if I were to describe it, I'd say it's sharper than any two-edged sword. <laughs> that so, sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hebrews 4.12. Yeah, there you go. Piercing to the division of soul and spirit, bone yeah. and marrow, well, discerning we'll make- the th- thoughts and intentions of the heart. You could just keep going, I have a feeling. <laughs> well, we're going to make that, that link available and you know, let people know where they can go and get that. And I think that I would encourage everybody that wants to go deeper, you want a, you want a commentary that you can depend on. Not all commentaries are the same. Mm, you right. know, uh, Commentary reflects, in some ways, the philosophical or political views of the people that are putting it together. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's one of the things we need to learn a little bit more about is to be Choosy in the right way. Yeah, I was going to say picky, but choosy is a good word. <laughs> but we need to be we need to be picky about that. You know, we mm-hmm, need to choose mm-hmm. wisely. Mm-hmm. And so I, oh, I heartily yeah. endorse that. Because um, you know, for many years on the library bookshelves of most priests were commentary series that unfortunately were rationalistic in their presuppositions. Mm-hmm. Um, or bought into the demythologizing yes. of the Bible, yeah. which means any time the Bible recounts a miracle or a supernatural event, well, that obviously we know that can't have happened, so we have to explain it away mm-hmm. in some human way. And unfortunately, many priests were formed by that mentality. Right. So even if they, they believe themselves, they kind of they didn't learn how to explain the Bible in a way that really comes from faith yeah. and that takes as takes for granted God does act yeah. God does speak yeah. God does do supernatural things Well if you have to if you have to explain away the, the miracles in the Bible then you're going to be faced with having to explain away the miracles in the modern times because they're happening <laughs> Amen to that They're happening They and, sure are And it's an exciting time Well let's turn to scripture because we're looking mm-hmm. we're looking now at the patriarchs and when we say Patriarchs. We're dealing with Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis 50. But that word patriarchs, you know, mm-hmm. just to start off right at the beginning, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, yeah, well, the Old Testament's a very patriarchal look, um, a male-oriented look at life. And they mm-hmm. sort of dismiss it at that point. Mm-hmm. So when we mm-hmm. talk about patriarchs, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking basically about the three founding fathers, so to speak, of the mm-hmm. chosen people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's true that the Bible was was written in a, a patriarchal culture in the sense that women were not fully recognized in their equal dignity with men. Um, men were seen mostly as the ones who were capable of making decisive choices, taking leadership. But nevertheless, God is able to give his living word his inerrant word, even through limited human beings. Mm -hmm. And so even the Catechism says that there are things in the Old Testament that are imperfect, Mm -hmm. that are provisional, preparing for the fullness of revelation in Christ. So there are cultural limitations to the human authors, but God, the divine author, is able to speak through them Mm -hmm. exactly what he wants said in exactly the way he wants it said. In some ways, what people are saying is that I, I think that in order for the Lord to speak into the lives of these people called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's going to have to wait until they are sociologically perfect. <laughs> As if we are. <laughs> but that's what they're kind of saying is that, no, we uh-huh. want something that's perfect out yeah. there. Then, yeah. God, you pour yourself into that Yeah. instead yeah. of the Lord taking us right where we're at and saying, let me give you some revelation. Exactly. And How let, could he redeem the world? Yeah. If yeah. He was waiting for a perfect world. It would never happen. Well, let's start with Abraham, because Abraham is not from the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan, 50 miles wide, 150 miles uh, long, and uh, from north to south, oftentimes called the Levant. It's this area, this land bridge. And he's taking Abram from Babylon, basically, or from you know, Ur the Chaldees, modern-day Iraq, I should say. And he's bringing them all the way over into uh, the land, and he calls it the Promised Land. And sometimes we don't even think about that name, do we? Mm -hmm. The promised Mm -hmm. land. That's Mm -hmm. land that's promised Mm -hmm. to to Abram. And it's there that God stages this amazing relationship and this covenant that's going to take place. Mm -hmm. So let's start there with God's going to enter into a covenant with this one man. 
Well, it, it's um, amazing how God begins. He, he just kind of, out of nowhere, he speaks to this man. Why this man as opposed to anybody else? I mean, was Abraham mm-hmm. super righteous? You know, had he done everything perfectly up to then? No, we don't have any indication of that. He, he was a pagan, living among pagans, but God chose him. And, and God began to speak to him, and he said, I want you to leave your land, your kindred, your father's house. So he asks for this unbelievable letting go. I mean, let go of your security. Mm-hmm. Let go of your family relationships. Let go of your, your pension plan. Let go of you know any hope you have of identity, security. Mm-hmm. And go to the land I'm going to show you. He doesn't even say where. Yeah. I want you to just go. Just yeah. put one foot in front of the other and, and go. And Abraham went. Yeah. It's just, it's so stark. No questions, no hesitation. He just went. And then in, in, re, in response to the threefold letting go that God requires of him, he gives him this threefold promise, mm-hmm. this incredible promise. You're gonna, a nation is going to descend from you, mm-hmm. which means you're going to have both descendants and a land that they can call their home. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make your name a blessing. Mm-hmm. so that all the nations of the earth will will bless themselves by you mm-hmm. and it will make your name great so to god asks everything mm-hmm. of this man but he promises something so much greater sure. and the rest of genesis is basically all about is god really going to come through on the promises yeah because for a long time it seems like he's not it's and, a question modern people have too. Is yeah, God going to absolutely. come to, come through on His promises? You mentioned the three promises: you got land, you got royal dynasty, or um, great make name. a name for your, yourself, make, make you a great name, and and worldwide blessing. As you were talking, I was like, you know, sometimes we talk about revelation knowledge, you know, where the Lord just speaks to you in the Word of God, and I was, and it happened right when you were talking there. I was thinking of the scripture, and I think it's Mark ten, at the end of March, Mark ten, where Jesus says. Uh, you know, they say, well, we've given up everything for you, Lord. And he says, I tell you, he who uh, has given up uh, family, children, mother, father, house, land for me will receive a hundredfold in this life mm-hmm. and in the world to come, eternal eternal life. And I was thinking, as you were talking about that, I thought, that's an awful lot like Abraham. He's yeah, leaving sure land, is. home, mother, father. He's leaving yeah, everybody. Yeah. And what's God going to give him? Incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I, that's true. I've yeah. never so thought we're of all that like, before. We're all in Abraham. Yeah. We're, we're all called to go on pilgrimage yeah. like Abraham. Leave, you could put that in your behind. commentary. It's free. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely free. With full no, attribution. <laughs> no footnotes even. But isn't that beautiful, that connection there? It's, it, you know, the more I study the Bible, I know that you, you feel the same way. I knew the Bible better when I was 18 than I do now. <laughs> because, you know, you read it through and think, oh, I really know it. But, but it just keeps getting deeper. Yeah, and it does. Deeper. And you see things that you. You, you keep seeing things. Yeah, and you, you go over like, a story like that? that. And you think, I could never know more than that. I mean, I think, I've, I, think I have uh, squeezed every bit of juice out of it, <laughs> yeah. and you haven't, you know. Uh-uh. So let's start with Abram. Uh, he doesn't start off real well, you know, mm, and really. No. Uh, and I'm no. speaking about his marriage. Yeah. What happened yeah. there? Well, um, obviously, God has promised descendants, which means Sarah, his wife, uh, Sarai, she's called at the beginning, plays a key role. And um, almost the first thing that happens when he gets to the promised land is that there's a famine. Mm -hmm. So much so, so severe that he has to leave the land. He goes to Egypt. Mm -hmm. So this is like the first threat to the promise. Wait a minute. God promised me this land, and now I have to leave it because it's not even supporting life. They go to Egypt, and Abram is afraid for his own safety because his wife is beautiful. Yeah. And he, he believes that they're going to abduct her, and you know the king is going to take her for his harem. And if they know that he's her husband, Abraham could be killed. Sure. So he passes her off as his sister. And sure enough, the king of Egypt kidnaps her, basically takes her into his harem. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's really important to recognize is the patriarchs are not like shining examples of like Mm -hmm. saints from beginning to end. (laughs) Yes, they were men of great faith who believed in God, but they were diamonds in the rough 
and they had character flaws, Mm -hmm. and they had failings. And what you, you see there with Abraham is he is more concerned about his own safety than the honor and safety of his wife. So he allows her to get taken into the, the, the harem of the king of Egypt, which not only threatens her, but threatens the, the God's promise of descendants. Mm-hmm. And even going back to chapter 3 of Genesis, when Adam and Eve fall, they sin, they turn away from God, and God makes this great promise that he's going to put enmity between the seed of the woman yeah. and the seed of the serpent, which means evil, Satan, the seed of the serpent is going to be ultimately defeated by the seed of the woman. He's going to crush his head, right? So Genesis is really about following the seed of the woman, the royal seed promised by God all the way back at the fall. It's going to be passed down through the line of Abraham, through the chosen people. And here we have Abraham putting it all in jeopardy because he's afraid for his own safety. And that theme is so significant, it actually happens three times in Genesis. Hmm. Twice, Abraham lies about his wife, just says, oh, she's my sister, sort of like, you can take her. And once, Isaac does it, and each time, the whole plan is threatened, each time God intervenes, and he saves the matriarch, and thereby he saves the royal seed, who's going to be passed down and ultimately become the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah, for people that think it's just this big, you know, patriarchal story, right off the bat there, you have Abraham kind of blowing it and God standing up for the woman, you know, yes. and, and, yeah. save, and saving her. Yeah. And so it's kind of like a foil for Christ, the ultimate oh, bridegroom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Instead of sacrificing his wife, his bride, to save himself, he sacrifices himself wow. to save his bride. Yeah, good insights. There's a lot more, isn't there? It just, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's incredible. Well, you move, on, you move from Abram, and Abram, uh, in chapter 15, God begins this covenant, this covenant uh, celebration, you, you, I would say, with, with uh, Abram. And, he, and Abram says, you know, I know you gave me these promises, but I don't know if you realized I don't have kids. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty old. My wife's old. Granted, she's beautiful. But she's old, and uh, but Not I do getting any younger, God. And I do have an idea, though, God. I do mm-hmm. have an idea, and uh, Eliezer, mm-hmm. uh, my servant, could um, be my heir. Mm-hmm. And God says, "Yeah, no." Uh, <laughs> and so right away we have this uh, this ordeal of: Is Abram going to trust God? Yeah. Basically, um, God, I can see that you, you're probably not going to be able to carry out your promises, mm-hmm. so I'm going to help you with my solution, my human scheming. Yeah. And Abraham has a couple of different ways to do that. Right? <laughs> a couple chapters later, he's got a different solution yeah. to help God along. Yeah. He's got to learn to trust that what God says he will do, he will do. And his wife, uh, Sarah, she even has an idea. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. she? Well, that yeah, that's the one where, yeah. well, they're kind of both involved. Yeah. It's, um, it's the surrogacy thing. Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, Sarai is getting on 90 and still no baby, um, understandably. And mm-hmm. so I know, Abraham, you can go into my maid, Hagar, and mm-hmm. I'll get a child that way. Seems like a good idea, right? It seemed like a good idea at the time, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, you know, the maid's child w- would be considered as belonging to Sarai. Uh-huh. And um, so essentially, even though Genesis is so interesting because it doesn't pronounce moral judgments on the characters. It doesn't say, and do- doing this was bad. He should not have done this. Mm-hmm. She should not have done that. Rather, it shows you. Mm-hmm. It's not tell but show yeah. by the consequences. Very Hebraic. Of- Yes, very Hebraic. So, um, you know, it doesn't say that this act of Abraham having sexual relations with his wife's maid was immoral. Um, and, and in the culture of the time, it would have been considered completely normal mm-hmm. for, a, you know, a man had sexual access to his female servants. Mm-hmm. But Genesis actually shows you this is not in accord with God's plan. Mm-hmm. One of the ways is that if you if you pay close attention to the words that were used, um, she took the maid and gave him to Abram. It's the same words used in Genesis three when 
Eve took the forbidden fruit and gave it to her husband. You think that's a coincidence or is, uh-uh. is, is God saying something there? <laughs> yeah, not a coincidence. There's a pattern developing. <laughs> there is a pattern. And then you see the consequences of, of this, this violation of the covenant of marriage. Mm-hmm. And what it is is it introduces strife into the chosen family. Sure. And so there's there's now this jealousy and contention between yeah. Sarai and her maid. Till today. Mm-hmm. Till today. Yeah. Between Jews and Arabs, it has not wow. ceased till this day. Wow. So eventually then, you know, Abram says, you know, how, how will I know you're going to, how do I know this is going to happen? And God says, bring me a three-year-old, you know, heifer. And, uh, and that immediately alerts Abram, okay, God's going to make a covenant with me. And so that covenant that God made with Abram becomes a real foundation for all the other patriarchs as well. And even down into the times of David, they look back to this moment, don't they? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, they don't just look back to the nice stories about Abram. They're looking back to a covenant mm-hmm. that was made. How serious is a covenant in antiquity? And how different is it mm-hmm. from anything we know today? Yeah, it's hard for us to step into their shoes and realize Mm -hmm. just how seriously they took a covenant. But you kind of get an idea when you read how they made the covenant in Genesis 15. Abraham had to cut these animals in two. And the idea is that you you have these slain animals and each party walks between them. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of putting a self-curse on yourself. If I break this covenant, let me be like those animals. Yeah. So it's a way of kind of committing yourself absolutely. It's putting this conditional curse on yourself if I break the covenant. But then the incredible thing is that Abraham doesn't walk through between the pieces. Only God, symbolized by the flaming torch. Oh, the flaming torch, torch, yep. And the fire pot. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of showing kind of subtly God so commits himself to this covenant with Abraham and his people that God is going to uphold it not only from his side, where it was never in danger, but even from the human side. Now, that's different than a typical covenant, isn't it? Where two parties come together. When God mm-hmm. comes together, he's it's kind of like swearing by himself. He is, exactly. You, exactly. He does swear Literally, by himself. and he's taking yeah. responsibility. He's taking for responsibility for the the whole thing, Such both from his side and from the human side. Such a and deal. Yeah, only in the New Covenant do you see what it will actually cost God uh-huh. yeah, to yeah. uphold that covenant wow. on our side. I hope that people... The blood of his own son. I hope that people see that. I hope you see that. that when, you know, when you're talking about the covenant with Abraham and that God's making this covenant with Abraham, you're going to see the results of that many, 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 many pages later, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and, and but, but God will keep his, he is, he's covenant faithful. You know, the word hesed, mm. this God's covenant yeah. faithfulness. It's different yeah. than a contract. Absolutely. A loyal love mm-hmm. is one way to translate hesed. It's, it's a family bond. You know, the closest analogy we have on the human level is marriage. Sure. Yeah. But it, it's meant to be an absolute, total, self-giving permanent, unchangeable. That's God's covenant mm-hmm. with us. Well, we do know that God uh, keeps his word. Um, uh, Sarah uh, hears that uh, this idea about God giving her a child, she starts laughing at that a little bit. Mm-hmm. He and, laughs too. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Laugh. And they both laugh. And then uh, she ends up pregnant and, uh-huh. and she has a child and she names him he laughs. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you name the kid. Ha ha ha. But th- he, that's what Isaac means, you know, laughter. Mm-hmm. And so you do have that line now, that promise line of Isaac. And then where do we go from there? Well, Isaac gives birth to Jacob. Of course, there's the other son, Esau. Mm-hmm. And uh, the contention between the two of them is a big part of the storyline mm-hmm. of Genesis. Jacob then gives birth to his 12 sons who become the fathers of the 12 tribes. And as the the story goes on, you see these are not like paper mache cardboard saints. These, they are very colorful individual characters. Each has such a unique character and they all grow and develop. And you see that in a particular way with Jacob. I mean, he starts out 
a, you know, not an exemplary man, to say the least. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's a schemer. He's, he's a fraud. He's a cheat. He's ambitious. He's name? arrogant. <laughs> yeah. Supplanter. And trickster. Yeah. By the way, you know, you mentioned between the, the break, between the, the beginning and the end, that uh, you were commenting on Abraham, Isaiah, and Jacob. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I was I, wondering if you I uh, actually, meant to say Isaiah. I actually <laughs> said Isaiah. The truth is, every show we put one error in the show <laughs> just to see if our guest... Very clever. Okay, we're going to give you the the <laughs> prize. You get to go to the final round now. So, you know, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're focusing on, on Jacob now. Um, Rebecca is going to give birth to twins. Yep. And Esau is going to be the oldest by minutes, mm-hmm. seconds, whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jacob is going to be hanging onto the heel of Esau. Mm-hmm. It seems to be almost a neck, neck, neck tie, mm-hmm. you know, as far as mm-hmm. being born. But even those 35 seconds, 40 seconds, one minute, mm-hmm. the one minute bef- between the births means so much Yeah. as far as their lives. Only one is the firstborn. Mm-hmm. So uh, Esau comes out first. Um, he's hairy all over. So they give him a name that means hairy. And uh, Jacob comes out grabbing his heel. So they give him a name that means heel. So, uh, you know, I love the way they name their kids, yeah. hairy and heel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Esau has the privilege of being the firstborn. He has a firstborn status. Yeah. And in the biblical world, that meant everything. Because as firstborn, you are the heir of your father, mm-hmm. of his headship over the family, over the clan. And in the case of the family of Abraham, all the more, it means you are the heir of the covenant. Yeah. You're the head of Very the serious. covenant family. And the firstborn had the highest status among all the sons and also inherited the father's blessing, a special Blessing, which of mm-hmm. course in the biblical world is not just you know a well wishing, but is an effective word that that speaks provision, it speaks fortune, it speaks peace and flourishing in life. Yeah. You know when it, when a blessing is passed down from father to son. So um, Esau, as the older son, is the one who gets all that. And so, humanly speaking, he he has the higher. He's in the status. driver's seat now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what you see throughout Genesis is that God's standards are not man's mm-hmm. standards, and so again and again, God overturns the the preeminence of the world, the the preeminence of the older son. Yeah. And God chooses the younger, which in that world it meant the one of lesser status, the one less important in human terms. Mm-hmm. And, and God still does that today. He, he, right. he, doesn't, he doesn't act according to our measurements, our standards. Yeah. Well, even in the teaching of the church, you know, when you, you have uh, what's called the preferential option, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like mm-hmm. we're, the church is telling us, well, we know you want to be with the beautiful, the rich, and the influential, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. the poor have have the preferential option, yeah, you know, to, to go to the, the Lord's gaze is on them. So we have two things that, that happen between Esau and Jacob. Both of them, frankly, bother people when they <laughs> read it because we're so used to, uh-huh. it's got to be done exactly like, you know, fair and my, my definition of fair. The first is the birthright. Now, we, mm-hmm. so many people will read the Bible about the birthright, mm-hmm. uh, which Esau has, mm-hmm. but they don't know what a birthright is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you know, I was confused about that for so long, mm-hmm. too, until I, I learned Hebrew. It was so much fun to learn Hebrew. And then I, I realized that a birthright, Bechora, means basically the firstborn status. It's the same word. It comes from the word for firstborn. Mm-hmm. And it's actually very similar to the word for blessing, mm. Beracha. Mm-hmm. They, they have the same consonants. So it's really kind of two sides of, of one coin. Mm-hmm. So, so Esau... He, it's not just a name. It's not like a plaque over his bed. He actually receives more. Yeah. He, literally, he would mm-hmm. receive more of the inheritance, mm-hmm. the, a double portion mm-hmm. of his father's inheritance, yep. his firstborn. So if there's two brothers, then, then would, would uh, Isaac divide his, the inheritance into three and give two to Esau? Well, 
I don't think anybody knows for sure how it was done in that early period, mm -hmm. but at least in later biblical law, that was the understanding. Okay. The, the you first get more, though. Would, we know would that. get double what any other son would get. Yeah, yeah. I tried to remind my parents of that when I was growing up. <laughs> they weren't very biblical. My sister ended up. <laughs> so, okay, so we have the birthright, and this is where... Um, Rebecca gets involved. Uh, she gets involved. Yes. Actually, she gets involved in both cases. Yeah, yeah. So she's a schemer too. Mm -hmm. And um, That's where you, you got see, it. as as they're growing up, you, you kind of see the personalities come out. It, Jacob is a mama's boy. Yeah, he's a homeboy. He he likes to be at home. Uh -huh. Esau is the man's man. Esau likes to go out hunting. Yep. So Jacob decides he's gonna he's gonna finagle the birthright out of him. Right. And so Esau comes back from the hunt. He's famished, and Jacob has cooked up this pot of lentil stew. And Esau says, you know, give me some of that stew. And he comes across as a guy enslaved to his appetites. Like, he doesn't care about what's really important. Right. He, he's into instant gratification. Uh -huh. And Jacob is ready for this moment. Like, he's been preparing for this moment. He says, sell me your birthright. And Esau's like, what's a birthright to me? I'm, I'm hungry. Give me some of your stew. Mm -hmm. And so um, he, Jacob makes him swear. He swears. Jacob gets the birthright. So you see there, they both have acted in, in a non-exemplary way. Yeah. Esau, enslaved to his appetite. Jacob, scheming to, to grab what belongs to his brother. But Esau sells him the birthright. So... Yeah. So now it belongs to Jacob. But then the kind of part two of the story is when Rebecca gets involved. Do you think and she was involved in any way in the first one? When I said that earlier, I'm, I'm thinking of her general influence, that, that mm -hmm. the day that Jacob came up with the, the scheme, I, I can't help but believe that maybe his mom talked to him about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just didn't suddenly dawn on him that day. Of, yeah. Hmm. This would be a good day to trick my it, brother. It reminds me of the mother of the sons of Zebedee in the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. to Jesus, you know, I yeah. got an idea. Yeah. My sons are going to be at your right and left hand. <laughs> right. Well, that's why I say that about, I say that about Rebecca in this issue of the birthright. I, I guess I'm reading between the lines a little bit and, and thinking she might have given him the idea. She certainly did on the second one. Yeah, you could, it could be. Genesis really invites you to read between the lines, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So much that's left unsaid that we can think about and connect the dots. Yeah. By the way, just one, let me insert this. The, the New Testament does give commentary on Esau. Yeah. And, and the New Testament calls him a profane man. Yeah. And I wonder if there is that connection between Esau being a profane man, profane meaning uh, they do not honor, or they, they count that which is holy as common. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about what you said earlier with Abram. And his wife yeah. was Abram a profane man at that point by saying, I'm going to treat my wife as common rather yeah. than the, the jewel she is, the prize yeah. that, that That's she is. That's an interesting is. point. Well, I think the reason it says that about Esau is two reasons. One, it says he married two Canaanite women. And, and those women were very troublesome to his parents. Mm -hmm. But if, if we look back, we, we see that his father and his grandfather were forbidden to marry the women of Canaan. And throughout the future mm -hmm. history of Israel, the temptation is going to be to intermarry with idolatrous pagans. Right. And it's always going to lead people down the wrong road. So um, the fact that Esau married these two Canaanite women of the land, the, you know, the people who were known for their immorality, it, it suggests that he kind of had lack of restraint sexually. Yeah. And then his willingness to give up his birthright, yeah. which is a sacred inheritance in the family of Abraham, a covenant with the living God. All of that, that he, all of that adds to being profane, right? Yeah, that, that he counted a bowl of lentil stew as more valuable than the sacred covenant with God. You know, one one hour of pleasure he traded in mm -hmm. at such a long, you know, huge long term loss. Yeah. In that sense, he was profane. Time out. Don't we do that today sometimes? <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. What we sacrifice for <laughs> oh, yeah. one hour, one day, one month, one, one paycheck, whatever it might be. 
Yeah. It's a good lesson. Yeah, one it, moment It's a really good lesson. Yeah. How easily we trade in our birthright yeah. as children of God. The inheritance, Paul says in the in Ephesians, this incredible inheritance that we have yes. to trade that in. Something to be learned. Now I know why it says these things were written for yeah. <laughs> our instruction. <laughs> our, in, our instruction. So the birthright. Now the second one is the blessing. Now they typically would go together, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And like I said, the two words in Hebrew are so similar. Yeah. They're really kind of two sides of the same thing. So um, so Jacob finagles uh, Esau out of the birthright, and then he really cheats him out of his blessing. Mm-hmm. So not, not a great start, right, for a man yep. chosen by God. But it's important to note that um, even when they were still in the womb, God spoke to Rebekah. That's right. And said, the, young, the older will serve the younger. Yeah. So God actually already chose Jacob from the womb. Yeah. He was already God's choice. Before reminds he had reminds me of Jeremiah, you know, that God knew him even in the womb. Yeah. So it's so ironic that he tries to get by hook or by crook, by his own scheming, mm-hmm. what God had already promised to give him. Yeah. Again, today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do we ever do that? So, how, so what does the blessing mean? Well, the blessing is... Um, you know, it's an efficacious word from God mm-hmm. that essentially means God is going to pour out prosperity, life, uh, abundance, relationship mm. with himself. It's so hard to describe because it's pretty much everything that God yeah. wishes to give us. Everything like the word good. shalom, it's just not yeah, peace. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like the word shalom. Yeah. So, so who wouldn't want that? Right. Who? Now, in that time period, it was understood in a, a more material sense, yeah. like you know, wealth, riches, land, headship, um, headship, numerous children, all of yeah. that, and and that's very real. You know, yeah. God delights in that too. But now we realize it's even infinitely greater. Well, the birthright, Jacob didn't really, he didn't really trick him. He just said, "I'll buy it from you," mm-hmm. and Esau said, "I'm hungry. Why not?" You know, mm-hmm. it's worthless mm-hmm. to me, mm-hmm. which might, which means maybe he didn't plan on being that leader that, you know, that God intended the firstborn to be. But in mm-hmm. this case, this is where Rebecca comes in, and there's some serious, serious, uh, uh, you know, deception. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, uh, as you know, um, Rebecca commands Jacob to put on his brother's clothes so he'll smell like his brother. And then uh, she puts goat skins on his hands so mm-hmm. that his hands will feel, feel hairy and rough, like his brother Harry <laughs> Esau. Yeah. And uh, Harry. <laughs> and uh, she she cooks up a delicious meal while Esau is out on his hunt. And uh, she must have known what uh, Isaac liked, you know. Like, yeah, I guess so. Get me my favorite meal. Yep. And so um, Jacob comes in carrying this delicious meal. Hello, father. Talking in a deeper <laughs> voice. <laughs> Me, dad. I am your manly son, Esau, ready to receive my blessing. Yeah. You don't sound like Esau. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Isaac, I, like Isaac's it? on to something, you know. <laughs> so then what happens? Well, uh, he, he tricks him. I mean, Jacob outright lies. He claims to be his firstborn, Esau. Let's him feel the rough skin on his hand. Smells him. Uh, smells him, <laughs> and you know doesn't quite all check out. But Isaac is he's getting blind at that point, and often physical blindness is symbolic of kind of a spiritual numbness yeah, in a person. Cataracts on the soul. Yeah, cataracts on the soul. And so you you get the idea that Isaac is is not as alert spiritually as he ought to be. Yeah. Um, but he falls for the ruse, and he. He gives him the blessing. And then uh, Esau comes back mm. and figures out, you know, hey, Dad, I'm here. I got the yeah, stew and everything. A... And Isaac's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I gave that already. Yeah. Now, at that point, why didn't Isaac say, well, that was taken from you, Esau, in a real scheme, mm. a trickster. Let's hit rewind. Exactly. You know, because of the way he got it, I'm afraid that didn't work. That wasn't valid, so I'll give you. Mm. But it didn't happen that way, did it? No, it didn't. The blessing of God is irrevocable. And mm. that blessing of Abraham passed down through the family line is a blessing of God. And so That's once power. pronounced, yeah. 
it it has a, a, a real status substance. It it cannot simply be rewound or undone. Yeah. yeah. What a lesson for us today, you know, the to receive the blessing of God and to know what that means and not to take it lightly. Yes. You know, especially like at the end of Mass. Bow your head. Yeah. And receive. Yeah, receive that blessing. Receive that blessing. It's a performative word. Yeah. That means it has power to effect. It's not good luck. What, no. Yeah. And, you know, that scene where Esau realizes and Isaac realizes what's happened is such a poignant scene. It says Isaac trembled violently and Esau cried out, like screamed out, don't you have a blessing for me? Father, bless me too. Desperation. Father. And he, he realizes what he forfeited by his own foolishness. Unfortunately, we often realize it after, you know. Yeah. But, okay, we don't so, want to realize it on the last day of our life, right? We don't want to be no. like Esau then. <laughs> so he's got, um, Jacob's got the uh, birthright. He's got the blessing. And everything is just jolly. And we're going to move <laughs> on. And, yeah. and if, thank God that over, that's over with. We can move forward. The problem is a lot of people can't move forward because they're wondering, <laughs> Dr. Healy, isn't there a verse that says he got a spanking? <laughs> Isn't there a woodshed event here after after all of that? Or did God just wink at mm. this? Mm. Certainly there's consequences. Yeah. That's so funny, Jacob. You know, I promised you this blessing and then you got it by cheating. That's great. Go ahead. Yeah. So no, happens? I mean, like so often happens in Genesis, um, it's so subtle. It doesn't say, oh, Jacob, that was so naughty. But it shows it. There are consequences. You said that earlier. You said God doesn't tell you, he shows you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So... Um, one of the patterns that you see through Genesis is sin leads to exile. Started in the garden, right? Mm-hmm. They disobeyed God. They can't stay in the garden. And so what happens after Jacob's deception of his father and his brother? He's got to leave because yeah. now Esau wants to kill him. So he has, to, he has to leave the promised land and go to Mesopotamia, to the extended family. Heron. It's basically a reversal of yeah. the call of Abraham. Yep, yep. Abraham was called out of Iraq, Mesopotamia, to the Promised Land. Jacob is now ejected back. <laughs> 400 miles. Yeah. Long way. Yeah. I like what so, you said there. That I mean, I don't like it, but I, I like it. It's a reversal. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, it, remi- it reminds me of the end of, the, uh, uh, of Judah, Zedekiah, you know, and you have uh, you have the well, you have the last king in the south going all the way back to Babylon. Yes, exactly. The yeah. exile of Israel. I mean, so much of what happens to the patriarchs yeah. is a foreshadowing, like a preview of what's going to happen to the nation. Again, we have these patterns. Look yeah. out for patterns, right? Yeah. Would you say that as a biblical scholar? Look uh, out yeah. for patterns because you're you gonna, you can see them in spades, <laughs> even into the into the New Testament. Yeah. So what happened so, to Jacob? Yeah. So he. Um, he has to go find – he ends up finding his family in Paddan Aram in Mesopotamia, and he, um, he takes up with his uncle Laban, and uh, he falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel, um, which is kind of a beautiful love story. And mm-hmm. Met her at the local watering hole. Yes, that's a pattern, isn't it? <laughs> Man meets woman at a well. Yeah. Wedding bells are ringing. So uh, he uh, – He pledges seven years of work for Laban, for Rachel, as his bride. Mm -hmm. Everything seems wonderful, right? He's getting blessed. But at the end of seven years of work, Laban tricks the trickster. And he brings him his bride at night after the wedding ceremony. Uh, You know, only the next morning does he discover it was her her sister, Leah. Older sister? He's married her older sister, Leah. Wow. And... um, he goes to Laban, what is this you've done to me? In our culture, it's not the custom to give the younger before the older. Aha. Uh-huh. Touche. He's been Jacobed. He's been Jacobed. Wow. The deceiver has been deceived. Wow. What you sow is what you reap. Wow. So Jacob You think has... Jacob was aware of that at the moment? And did kind of the eyes open like, oh. <laughs> and and, he, and he, when did he do it? You know, Isaac was blind. Mm-hmm. Uh, I imagine it's a little bit of alcohol, but certainly the middle of the night. Yeah, exactly. There's a pattern too. Yeah. You know, took advantage of his father's inability to see. 
Yeah, to, as Laban took yeah, advantage. Yeah, to take, take the place of the older as the younger. Now it's a kind of reversal. Yeah. Laban took advantage of nighttime, his inability to see, gave the older in place of the younger. I guess he's got to ask himself, am I willing to go seven more years for this? You know, <laughs> yeah. see that beautiful? Yeah. And yeah. he did, didn't he? He, he ended did. up working working another another set. That That is an amazing story. So what you're saying there is, is that to answer people's questions, aren't there consequences to this kind of behavior? And the answer is yes, mm-hmm. but God's not going to spell it out in one verse for you. He's going to show you what consequences mm-hmm. uh, mean. But I, and I wonder, even with Jacob, was, was Jacob certain that he had the blessing? Well, in, in his own heart, no. <laughs> yeah, because of the way he got it, maybe? <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Um, but he didn't trust God to begin with. Mm-hmm. He had to learn over time. And you really see his character being honed over time. And you see how God uses even the negative consequences of yeah. Jacob's own actions can turn into blessings. As, as Jacob suffers, you know, he suffers ha- having to, to leave the, the promised land alone, penniless. He suffers being tricked by his uncle. Mm-hmm. He, he suffers in even his marriage with two women who are in tension with each other. And his but, daughter. Yes, yeah, that too. Um, so in, in so many ways through his life, he suffers. And then when you get to the story of Joseph, <laughs> yeah. all over again. But he learns to trust God. Mm-hmm. And, and you see it um, in the episode where he's, he's leaving the promised land. He's, he's on his way out as a fugitive, an exile, and he has this dream. Jacob's ladder. Mm-hmm. He sees this ladder going up to heaven, and the angels of God ascending and descending, and then God himself speaks to him and says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. I'm going to bring you back to this land. And Jacob, at that point, you can see he's, he doesn't really know God yet. He doesn't really trust him yet. Mm-hmm. He says, well, if you do, if you protect me, if you bring me back to this land safely, then I will worship you as my God. It's very yeah. conditional. Yeah. It's a deal. It's, a, it's the bargaining phase of his life. Right. And it's only years later, really more than 20 years later, he comes back. Finally, God fulfills his promises, brings him back safely with 12 children. You say with move. a full quiver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, full quiver. Then Jacob is unconditional. Yeah. He worships God. You are my God. That's a beautiful thing. I, th- I really encourage people to, to, to pay attention to that. And that when you read the patriarchs, particularly Jacob, that you follow that, a man who doesn't trust God, and finally a man who trusts God, and what went on between? How did God do it? Maybe you can see some parallels with your, you know, your, your own life. That's, that's very, very powerful. Very powerful. So he ends up coming back after 20 years. Um, and he has, but it sounds like he has two problems. One is he gets into a wrestling match with God, mm. and he, he's, bit, you know, it's like God saying, "What do you want? What do you want? I want you to bless me," which means, well, you have been blessed, mm. but he wants mm. to hear it. I want to know that I'm that I'm blessed, and I think he's a little scared too because uh, he may end up with, meeting with Esau. Yeah, that's right. Well, I love that passage. It's, it's one of the most mysterious passages in the Bible where Jacob wrestles with, well, th- this, this unknown assailant comes mm-hmm. in the night yeah. and wrestles all night with him. Yeah. And, you know, by the end of the story, you realize this is God in some mysterious way. Why did he wrestle all night? I mean, you know, couldn't God have clobbered him <laughs> in an instant? Yeah, but God loves us to wrestle with him. And... It says at the end, he re- the, the angel or this mysterious man who's wrestling with Jacob realized he could not prevail. Now, what does that mean? Of course he could have prevailed. <laughs> he, he could have just, you know, in an instant smitten him. But what it means is Jacob wouldn't give up. This guy was so tenacious, he wanted Even that through blessing injury. of God. Yeah, he, he got his hip thrown out of socket. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's interesting. That's the hip because the, 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 the thigh, it's in the hollow of his thigh. And the thigh is a euphemism for the genitals. Mm-hmm. And the whole promise of God is going to come through the generative power. So mm-hmm. um, it's like God reminding him, this is from me yeah. from now on. This is not by your power. Right. I, I'm striking you in a memorable way in this 
most like circumcision with area. Abraham. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like circumcision. It yeah. is it is similar because you have to rely on me from now on. So the Jacob who originally tried to get the birthright and blessing by his own scheming, by his own human ingenuity, now he gets it just by insistently asking, wrestling yeah. for it. Yeah. He's, he's a different man. Yeah. He's still not perfect, but he's a different man than he was before. He's really come through his trials with God. Yeah, and then when they come back into the land, they get, they get in trouble with uh, the men of Shechem. And mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Dinah, his daughter, was abused. Mm-hmm. And uh, a couple of the boys mm-hmm. took uh, revenge into their own hands. And uh, after these yeah. men had made a covenant with Israel, they were in sore, been circumcised. And then these two brothers of Dinah, they go in, destroy him, disgrace to uh, to Jacob. Yeah, they carry out their own vigilante yeah, violence. Yeah, but then we the whole thing, the whole story of uh, Genesis and the lion's share of the patriarchal period is Joseph, mm. who is the eleventh son mm-hmm. of Jacob, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. not all the sons are with Rachel. Mm-hmm. The first four are Leah. Mm-hmm. For six. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, the first four, yeah, first and then four. two more after. Yeah. yeah, then then each each. Both Leah and and uh, Rachel, they, yeah, Bilha and Zilpha say, we, 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 you know, we're not able to have children right now. Please go into my maid again. That yeah. pattern, yeah. And so we have we have twelve boys from four women. Mm-hmm. God writes straight with crooked lines, doesn't? Yeah, he? yeah, yeah. If anybody thinks they have a dysfunctional family. <laughs> Just look at the family of Israel, yeah. which is the family tree of Jesus himself. Well, let's turn to the story of Joseph here, but let's do something kind of interesting. Let's look at the story of Joseph, not through the eyes of Joseph, not through the eyes of Reuben, not through the eyes of Judah or Tamar. Let's look at it through the eyes of Jacob still mm. and see mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. what was that like and what was going on. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. tell us a story, doctor. <laughs> Okay, well, from Jacob's point of view, um, he, he's got these 11 sons at this point, mm-hmm. um, eventually 12, and his 11th son, Joseph, is his favorite. He sees royal qualities in this young man, mm-hmm. and he openly uh, favors him. Learning the same bad lesson he got from his own parents, you know, uh, Isaac favored Esau, Rebecca favored Jacob. You know, parental favoritism can lead to so much hurt and tension. So uh, he openly favors Joseph, but this young boy is maybe a bit cocky, and he has these dreams, and he he's very happy to share his dreams. Everybody else is bowing down to me. Yeah. <laughs> the sun, moon, and stars. Help me oh. figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Help me interpret this dream. And um, so Jacob seems curiously unaware that the other sons are fuming with jealousy. And one day he, they're, they're out uh, herding the, the flocks, and he sends Joseph to look for them. And one of the fascinating things about the whole story of Joseph is how he prefigures Christ. Yeah. And here we see a father sending out his son in search of his brothers. And he goes, Joseph goes and seeks for them until he finds them. But they see him coming from a distance. They hate him with a murderous hatred. They cook up. First, they're going to murder him. Then they end up selling him as a slave. But what are they going to do to explain it to their father? They cook up this idea that they're going to take his robe, dip it in the blood of a goat, come show it to their father. Oh, Dad, we're so sorry. Mm -hmm. Look, do you recognize this robe by any chance? Well, isn't it interesting when you think of the fact that Jacob deceived his father by means of clothing and a goat? Mm. What goes around comes around. What you sow is what you reap. He's deceived by his sons by means of clothing and a goat. And... He, you know, he sees it, of course, he recognizes the robe of his son, and he, he cries out in anguish. And in Hebrew, it's, it's, it's so poignant. He says, Tarof, Toraf, Yosef. Joseph surely has been torn to pieces. Mm. Tarof, Toraf, Yosef. It's this anguish cry of a father. 
And, and even that is a little bit of a foreshadowing of the New Testament, you know, the Father giving up his only beloved son mm-hmm. and, you know, and experiencing the veil of the temple and... yeah the veil of the temple torn yeah so um the sons don't they don't say it outright they just leave joseph to jacob to draw his own conclusion yeah. he's, he's let, been killed let him marinate in the pain yeah um but there are a few little hints there that maybe he suspects them like he he's not even sure that his sons are safe but um, in any case, he, he goes for many long years thinking his son is dead uh, until uh, <laughs> the last part of the story, which mm-hmm. is fascinating, <laughs> the famine, yeah. which drives them to go buy grain in Egypt. And there's this high official, the vizier of Pharaoh, the second in command, prime minister of mm-hmm. Egypt, who is dispensing the grain and they bow to the ground before him. Uh Uh-huh, came true. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and uh, Joseph basically plays a series of tricks on them, but it's it's really testing them. It's testing them. Mm -hmm. Are you the same murderous, jealous brothers who sold me into slavery? Yeah, he seems to be interested in how how is the youngest being treated. Yes, right. How is dad? Exactly. So he he basically frames Benjamin, his younger brother, in a crime, and and he he wants to test their reaction. He he says, you know, he he is going to remain here a slave in Egypt. So what are the brothers going to do now? Is it going to be a replay, where they will go home enriched, leaving one brother, Simeon, a slave yeah. in in Egypt. And as the story turns out, they have changed. And you see it in Judah, particularly. Yeah, Yeah, I find it so interesting that, you know, you're backing up just a little bit. When they they came up with the idea of let's kill him, let's kill him, it was the firstborn who stopped it, Reuben. Mm -hmm. He's the Mm -hmm. one who Mm -hmm. said, no, no, Mm -hmm. no, no, no. Let's dig a pit and pray about it. Put them in there, you know. And then they I don't remember the pray about it. <laughs> <laughs> then they see the Ishmaelites coming by, and it is Judah who comes up with the idea to sell him. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. sell him into slavery. Mm-hmm. Sell him into slavery. So uh, we're, we're we're veering from Jacob's perspective, but this story has one of the oddest chapters right in the middle mm. yeah. of it, uh-huh. and dealing with Tamar, mm. who. Is Judah's daughter-in-law. Yeah. It's one of those chapters they don't include in children's Bibles. No, no. But, but <laughs> what's the sorted. heart of that, though? What's the meaning of that right in the middle? And give us a synopsis of it so people know what we're talking about. Okay. But it is weird. It is weird. Well, um, it's all about Judah. And uh, not much has been said up to now about Judah, the fourth son. Mm-hmm. And... He comes across very poorly in this chapter. He's um, immoral. He is consorting with Canaanites. He is um, insensitive. Um, he um, is, is not concerned about God's rules for the family. So he comes out very badly. And in essence, the story is that um, his two oldest sons die. So according to the custom of the times, mm-hmm. He should give the widow of the first son, who uh, was also the widow of the second son, to his third son so that the third son can bear children for his dead brother. But Judah doesn't do that because he doesn't trust God. He's afraid that his third son might die as well. So he he doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. So Tamar, who uh, is is this... um, widow who should have been given to Judah's third son in marriage, but she's now left widowed, destitute on her own, having no ability and, and to... that is bad. <laughs> that's really bad. In that bad. culture. In that culture. <laughs> Real bad. <laughs> that's really bad. So she plays a trick on, on Judah. She dresses up as a prostitute and sits by the road. And, and sure enough, Judah has a liaison with her. But she asks for a pledge from him. 
his signet, his cord, his staff. Essentially, give me your driver's license, your credit <laughs> cards, your, your, your badge, you know, give me everything. So um, she becomes pregnant. Judah, her father-in-law, finds out, and in the self-righteous fury, she will be burned at the stake. She committed prostitution. Of course, he's the one who committed prostitution, as he thought, yeah. right? But then she says, um, whose are these? Pray and tell. Pray tell. And he is shown up in that moment. He was. I mean, just went numb. His utter, face turns white. Yeah, utter embarrassment. But... The interesting thing about this story is, well, for one thing, she deceived him by means of clothing and a goat, because part of the pledge he paid her was a goat and her clothing. So it's this same family pattern, deceived by clothing and a goat. It happened with David, too, and his sons, this family pattern. Her fathers don't take care of, seems to live on. Yeah. But um, he actually becomes the first person in the Bible to repent. Hmm. He, he actually, he confesses she has been more righteous than I. Wow. He confesses he's been in the wrong. You see his character now is being formed. And why is Judah so important? Because he is the one who carries the royal line. Hmm. He is the ancestor of the Messiah, of, yeah. of David the king and ultimately Jesus. Yeah. And Tamar actually even though she's a Canaanite, you know, supposedly one of the immoral Gentile peoples, she's the one who has brought Judah to repentance and saved the royal seed. The royal seed comes through her. Yes, the, the, the family tree of Jesus mm-hmm. comes through her. But you see that so, reflected in the New Testament. Yeah, she's actually mentioned yeah. in the genealogy of Jesus. Go figure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, four women. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the genealogy of, of Jesus is, it reads like a, a soap opera, if you know yeah. the, the stories behind the names. But what you actually see is Judah himself coming to repentance, acknowledging his wrongdoing, being humbled and changed in his character, yeah. which is going to play a crucial role in the story of Joseph, in the conclusion of the Joseph story, and um, is preparing him uh-huh. for his kingly role as the leader of the tribes. Oh, wow. That's really, it's just so touching because, you, you know, you, you're hinting about that where we have, we have uh, the story of Benjamin being held back, and then Benjamin's going to have to to uh, to go because Pharaoh's second in, in command, Joseph, wants to see him. Mm-hmm. And he comes back, sets up another scheme, mm-hmm. and it looks like Benjamin's the guilty one. Mm-hmm. And then one man stands up and says, uh, I can't deal with this anymore. I cannot deal with this anymore. Take me. Take my sons. Take." And it's... Yeah. It's one of the most beautiful... Judah chapters in Genesis is Judah's speech in Genesis 44, where he says, um, I cannot let my father bring his gray hairs down to the the grave in sorrow. And I cannot let my brother remain here as a slave. Take me instead. A few chapters earlier, he was saying, he's saying, sell him. Yes, exactly. I don't care. Exactly. He has radically transformed. Wow. So you could call the story about Joseph, and maybe we should do that. We, we, we talk about the story of Joseph, but it's really the story of Joseph and Judah. Yes, it is. It really is. Yeah. In so many ways. I wonder how we just, how do we get to just focus on, on Joseph, just because of Donny Osmond or what? I mean, you know, how come that just became the, the focus uh-huh. when underneath the surface, yeah. it's the seed line of Jesus Yes, right. that is yeah. being dealt with by God? Right. Well, I mean, it's true that more chapters are devoted to Joseph. Um, It goes into a lot of detail of his fortunes and misfortunes in Egypt and how he rises to incredible prominence. And Mm -hmm. and he, in his own way, is such a figure of Christ, a type Mm -hmm. of Christ. But but then a little bit in the background, but also incredibly important, is is Judah, who um, has more than any other character. He has this... 
repentance and transformation. And Jesus will be will be called the the lion the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah. So we end the patriarchal period with a whole basket full of blessings. And how does how does that go? Well, um the uh, all the brothers and their wives and children are brought into Egypt in state mm-hmm. and given the best of the land, the land of Goshen, treated royally by Pharaoh and by Pharaoh's prime minister, Joseph. Life's good. And life's really good. And you might think that's the end of the story, right? Mm-hmm. But of course it's not because they're not in the promised land. Right. So um, that's when you have to turn the page to Exodus. And God's mm-hmm. plan was actually revealed in the blessings, right? You know, at the very end when Jacob's going to line up his sons and he's, gonna, he's going to give them a word, I guess you could say a word from God about mm-hmm. what's going to happen to them mm-hmm. in the future. And that's where it seems that the scepter shall fall to Judah. To Judah. Mm-hmm. Not Reuben. Reuben, you know, messed around with uh, his, his father's maids. And mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't uh, Simeon or Levi, because mm-hmm. they, what they did to uh, shame Jacob over Dinah mm-hmm. being, being uh, abused, mm-hmm. it falls to the fourth. Mm-hmm. Now, this is, I find this interesting, too, that the bloodline, you could say, or this, this genealogical line to the Messiah, Jesus, is through the fourth son, which is the son of Leah. Mm. Again, a surprise. Yes, right. In a trivial game, right. a trivial game, nobody would have won that. <laughs> they would have said, "Yes, right." You know, Rachel. Rachel was the beloved. Yeah, yeah. And then mm, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Leah. So to wrap this part of, of it up, you know, I want to I want to get on and ask you about your own Bible study a little bit, but. What is the lesson? If you were to say, what is the lesson of the patriarchs? You know, what is, what is a lesson of the patriarchs? And what can we take away? What can we take away from that in our own lives today? There's so many. It's hard to state just one. But uh, I think one that really comes to the fore is God will come through on his promises. Mm-hmm. Amen. God will He'll make promises. And then he'll let things get to the point of the Mm -hmm. absolutely impossible. No way this could ever happen. Like, you know, Abraham is 75 when he promises a a son, and he lets him get to 100. (laughs) Sarah is 90. So God lets things seem to be absolutely impossible, hopeless, um, you know, no way out of the quandary. And then he comes through on his promises. Yeah, that's a good word. You know, God does come through on his promises. One of the things I take away, that's yours. One of the things I take away, I think it's good. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I take away too is uh, this happens over quite a few years Mm -hmm. in that we want things now Mm -hmm. and we want to be formed now. We want to become like Jesus now. Mm -hmm. I want to learn my lesson now. I don't Mm -hmm. want this to go on for. 40 years or 30 years or the 20 years that, that Jacob was up in Haran, you know, up north after 20 years. And I think that's something, too, that we need to, to realize is that when you look at the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you look at their lives, you see some major stories going on there. But that if, you, if you put that on a timeline, there are hundreds and hundreds of days where they got up, mm. had to make breakfast, change diapers, <laughs> do the laundry. They had to do everyday stuff. Mm-hmm. And that yeah. their lives were not like this every single day. Yeah. You're looking at a highlight reel, but they had they had to live life. Yeah, you know? that's really true. And so if we yeah. look at their lives and say, none of that's happening to me. I must not be living a life of a, you know, a son or a daughter of God. You got to be fair to yourself a little bit there too, and that you're looking at the highlight reels. That's learn a great from point. the learn from the highlights. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, right. Because yeah. it's going to be yeah. 324 days in between the next highlight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're going to have to live. Yeah. So that's really and one good. more point that I think is sure. so crucial is that God uses the mistakes and failures and even sins of those who trust Him. As yeah. as long as somebody is still walking with God, even when they blow it, yeah. God is going to use that. Praise God. Well, thank you so much. Uh, boy, there's just, that is a lot. 
And that's 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 rich. We're gonna we're gonna come back in a moment, but that is really really rich. And I really encourage you. This is not the kind of uh, show that you you watch once and say, "Oh, that was pretty good." What are you doing next? But to listen over and over and get your Bible out, listen prayerfully, and uh, and ask the question: What is God doing in my life today? Can I learn anything? Am I in the place of any of these characters right now? Am I doing what they? We're doing both good and bad. And that's the, the beauty of the Word of God. It was written for your instruction, we're told in the New Testament. When we come back, we're going to look into the life of Dr. Mary Healy in studying the Bible for herself, not studying it for you necessarily, but or for her seminarians, but for her own walk with God. What does she do? Money. It can be a blessing and a burden. Do you ever wonder about how you're going to make ends meet? Is money a source of tension in your marriage? Do you wish you could be more generous with your giving? Most of us were never taught how to manage our money from a Catholic worldview. This is why I am so excited to tell you about the Catholic Money Academy. Since 2017, they've helped thousands of Catholics eliminate debt, build their savings, morally invest, and increase in their generosity through their step-by-step program rooted in Catholic principles. If you're ready to feel confident and at peace with your finances, visit catholicmoneyacademy.com slash Jeff to start your free trial. And they've got kids' classes too. That's catholicmoneyacademy.com forward slash Jeff. Welcome back to the Bible Timeline Show. Our guest is Dr. Mary Healy. And we have been uh, just blessed to hear all about the, the period of the patriarchs. But now it's time to turn our attention to you, your Bible, your Bible study, what do you do on a daily basis to interact with the Word of God? Well, it's really pretty ordinary. I um, I praise God for a long time. I just you know like to praise Him, thank mm-hmm. Him, and be in His presence and um, just enjoy His presence. And then I I read Scripture, and it it varies at at different seasons of my life. Sometimes I use the Magnificat, and I go mm-hmm. through the daily readings for Mass. And uh, usually I'll focus on one of them mm-hmm. in particular and do Lexio Divina on it, meditate yeah. on it. Other times I'll read through a particular book of the Bible over a period of months. I'll take months to read a particular book. Mm-hmm. A couple of years ago, I, I just I had this tremendous urge to memorize a book. And, and so I did, the Book of Romans. And uh, it took me months. I bet and, it did. I bet it did. Yeah. The whole but, book. Yeah. And it gets um, hard, particularly towards the end. Yeah, where he gives his travel plans and all, all mm-hmm. that. But yeah. I tell you, it was such a blessing. It, 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 it kind of got it you into You really my, memorized the whole book? Yeah. I, you know why I did I, I did it? Genesis and Exodus, and I thought I was weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I thought you were joking with me at first. No, no but you know why I did it? Because... Um, my cousin knew a, a man in Slovakia during the communist period mm-hmm. who – he was a pro-life doctor, and he knew that it was likely he'd eventually be thrown into prison and that his Bible would be taken from him. So he memorized the Gospel of John, and sure enough, he was thrown into prison. And he, he was put in solitary confinement. He was there for years, and, and afterward he said, I survived because I had the Word of God here. <laughs> wow. There, there's something about memorizing Scripture, even if it's one verse. Mm-hmm. Our minds are made for Scripture. Yeah. There, there's something about our mind. God created us to hear His Word and know His Word. And I think it's very powerful yeah. to memorize Scripture, even if it's just one verse that has stood out to you, the Holy Spirit has highlighted for you. You know, write it down, put it on your bathroom mirror, do whatever you need to do. Mm-hmm. Say it over and over every day until you get it in your bones. Yeah. And I think personally saying I can't, I can't memorize things is a cop-out. I do. You know why? Mm-hmm. 
God created you in a marvelous way, mm -hmm. your mind, mm -hmm. your brain. Mm -hmm. And you'd be shocked at, you wouldn't, but people would be shocked at what you can actually do in one day in terms of just navigating life. You're smart. You're brilliant. You're, <laughs> you are the most amazing creature in the world. And you're uh -huh. telling me you can't memorize yeah. 20 words? Yeah, that's Give a good a point. Give me a break. Give me a break. And the thing is, when when you memorize it, even if you don't have it perfectly, word for word, but it'll be there inside, and then at the most unexpected times, it's going to come into your mind. It's yeah. going to pop in just at the moment you need to hear it. Or you're talking to somebody else who needs to hear it. Yes. And it's yeah. it's there, and it's life-giving. Hundreds of times. And it's a living word, and it's now. It's God's now word. Yeah. What do they call that? You know, there's this idea of this, the logos, and they talk about the rhema. You know, this all of a sudden, this this word to you, this this sudden mm -hmm. word. And mm -hmm. I have had that happen so many different times in my life, mm -hmm. where, like for example, I was I was I was driving down to the doctor appointment, and it was sleeting out really bad. You know, and it was like October, November, and up ahead there was this lady pulled over on the side of the road. And her car wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So I pulled over and I said, what's going on? It's sleeting. And, and she says, my car just stopped. She said, do you know anything about cars? Look at my, no, I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> I said, and then all of a sudden, scripture came to my mind. Mm -hmm. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And I thought, what do I do with that? So I said to her, you know what? I don't have anything, I don't know anything about cars, but I'm a Christian. I said, I'd be more than happy to pray for your car. And she said, wow. she said, you what? I said, <laughs> I will pray. That's all I got. I'll pray for you. She said, okay. So I sort of get in the seat when I tell you, turn the key, turn the key. So I stood there over the engine thinking, okay, Lord, <laughs> I put you on the spot and I I put my hand on the engine and he said, Lord, just show her that you love her. And I said, all right. She turned the key, boom, started right up. And I'm just, whoa, I was whoa. shocked. I was Amazing. shocked, you know. But that came because one scripture came yeah. up at the right moment. Otherwise, yeah. I would have said, do you need Medicine. a ride? Do you need a ride uh -huh. in the next, uh -huh. next exit? Which would have been a very human act of kindness. But yes. what you gave her was supernatural. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah, I, gave her, I gave her what I had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. So you, okay, so you... You do a lot of different things. You have a strategy where it isn't the same thing every day for 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mix it up. Yeah. yeah. And in, in the past, I don't do this as often now, but in the past, I also did like a thematic kind of study. Mm -hmm. like, um, like, I want to know about the holiness of God. Holiness. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would get out a Bible dictionary and I would look up, what does it say about holiness? Where are the key passages sure. about holiness? Read those passages. What are the cross-references? Go to the cross-references. Mm -hmm. Read those passages. And, and really try to you know, get, get a handle on that theme. Mm -hmm. and, and often it would bring such deep insight. You know, it would begin to connect the dots with all kinds of other themes throughout Scripture. Yeah. So do you have other Bibles? Do you have oh. a lot of Bibles? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I haven't counted. <laughs> well, I can't wait to ask you this question. Because as deep as you get into Scripture, do you mark in your Bibles? I'm sorry to say that I'm one of those people that has a a clean Bible. <laughs> okay, I think we need I to go to a, a break. I like think we need. We'll be back. And <laughs> you what? You don't even read in your Bible? Any no. of them? I know. I even, I even bought one time those special colored highlighters. And you couldn't but bring yourself to I do it. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I'm sorry. So that's interesting. I would have uh, thought yeah. you were, yours yeah, would look I, like Scott Hahn's, just a mess, you know. <laughs> that's something else. So, so where do you write ideas down? You certainly do that. Don't tell me you memorize all your ideas. Too. This is getting out of hand. <laughs> no, I don't. And I'm actually not that good at memorizing. I just work at it. So what do you, where do you I, write I, your I, ideas down? I write them on my computer and it's actually really helpful if I'm being asked to give a talk, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's to a Bible study group or whoever it might be. Um, I'm forced to think through a, sure. a, a part of the Bible or a theme in the Bible. Right. And, um, and often, you know, I'll just go to my room and, or I'll go to the Adoration Chapel and I'll just sit before the Lord and say, Lord, what's, what's your word on your heart that you want to give through my heart to mm. the heart of your people? Yeah. And, and, it's there. and I'll just start praying about it and thinking about it. And then I'll, you know, I may flip, you know, scripture may come to mind. I'll flip to that and I'll read that. And something else may come to mind. And 
Sometimes it's a real struggle. It's a, it's a, it's a labor. Mm -hmm. And then other times it's like this download. And mm -hmm. I'm just writing as fast as I can or I go on my computer. And you know, you I like it when, when the Lord does it that way. <laughs> do you use uh, computer software uh, for Bible yeah. software? Yeah, I use, I use um, Bible Works okay. and Verbum. Oh, Verbum. Verbum's like Logos, but Catholic. Yes, Yeah, exactly. and I use that too. I, I use Accordance also. Accordance is uh, mm. both for uh, Mac and um, whatever that other one is, <laughs> CP, PC. I, I use Verbum. I use, I use Accordance. Uh, but I, I spend more time, I think, just in writing down my insights on on uh, um, files and the computer and matching mm -hmm. them and, you know, mm -hmm. connecting them and, and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And I write on little pieces of paper, too. So, okay, <laughs> let, let me ask you this. Who is your favorite, uh, well, I don't say your favorite person in the Bible, who do you identify with the most of all the hundreds of characters in the Bible? Mm. I think mm. I'd have to say with St. Paul. Mm. I love St. Paul. Sometimes he's annoying and <laughs> frustrating. So the, why do you like him so much? Because he had such a passionate love for Christ mm. and such a passion for evangelizing, for spreading the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, he had such a, a clarity about what Jesus had done for him and how undeserving yeah. he was. And... Mm -hmm. um, what a free gift the gospel is and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives mm -hmm. and the supernatural signs and wonders that the Lord does through spreading the gospel. Yeah. And, and he had such a, um, such a zeal, woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. Mm -hmm. What about a favorite verse? You have one? Well, I ha have to say, this is a popular one, um, Galatians 2.20. That's mine. <laughs> well, uh, no fair. I, I said it first. I'm the, I'm the host. <laughs> I'm the host, and you're going to have to find another one. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> no, I, is that really yours? Is it? Yeah. Wow. That's mine, too. Why do you like it so much? Uh, it kind of says it all. Crucified with Christ. Yeah. The life I live, I live... I, I live no longer I, but Christ lives in me. And something? the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's mine, too. And that, that you know, you were talking earlier about Scripture coming and speaking to you and ministering to you. And that one of all has spoken to me spontaneously, uh, I'd say hundreds of times mm. in my life. Yeah. And I too. stumbled on it. And, you know, it's, uh, I heard about people saying, do you have a life verse? They asked the question, do you have a life verse? And I thought, what do you mean a life verse? I mean, a, a verse that really is so personal to you, that, that God is saying that to you mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. And I would say, that's my life verse, you mm -hmm. know? Wow. So, yeah. yeah. So we've got, we go. we got, the, there's we got the same I liked one. I about you. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Well, let's look at, we got questions, okay? Mm -hmm. A number of people have uh, written in, and uh, we have a lot of questions. We're going to narrow it down today. Our first question, uh, Dr. Healy, is from Molly. And Molly says, uh, she's asking, as a parent, I really struggle with the story of Abraham and Isaac. I find it really hard to accept that a loving God would test someone by telling them to kill their child. How can I understand this better? Yeah, well, I'd have to say, um, first of all, Molly, you're right to struggle with that story. Yeah. It, it's, it's written in such a way that we are meant to struggle with it. Shocking. We shouldn't just read that and say, oh, that's cool. You know? um, <laughs> yeah. Give up your son. No problem, yeah. Abraham. Um, and how many great minds through history have really wrestled with that story? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what kind of God is this that would ask a man to immolate his own son mm -hmm. who, who would give him the promise after so many years of waiting and longing and hoping mm -hmm. And then take it all back. We're supposed to struggle. What kind of God is that? Well, I'd say that Genesis doesn't give us like simplistic answers, but it does give us some clues. And one is right at the beginning when it says God tested Abraham. It was a test. And, and 
scripturally a test is a, a, a painful, difficult trial that brings somebody to a point of decision. Will I honor and love God above all else? Everything else, even what is most precious, or not? Mm-hmm. And so God, he, he, he is going to give Abraham the greatest blessings any human being has ever received up to that point. But in order to receive the blessing, Abraham had to make that decision. He had to come to that point of decision. Will I love God even more than the biggest gift God has given me, right. which is my son? And he passes the test. And God is profoundly moved by that. And what, what we see is that God stops the action yeah. of Abraham slaughtering his son before he goes through with it. He doesn't want his son to be slaughtered. He doesn't want child he sacrifice. Never intended it. Yeah, he never intended it. And through the rest of the Bible, it becomes clear child sacrifice is abhorrent yeah. to God. Right. God does not want us to kill yeah. children in sacrifice to him or for any other reason. But he did want Abraham to come to that point of decision, I'll give you even this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nothing will come between me and you. Yeah. So I think it's, it's helpful for Molly to understand that, uh, that God didn't ask Abraham to do this because he thought it was a good idea. He, it was a test mm-hmm. and never intended for that child to, uh, to, be, to be sacrificed. Probably a young man by that, by that time. Mm-hmm. Juanita, why didn't Rachel get buried in the tomb with Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Leah, and eventually Jacob, who's better known as Israel? That is a really good question. Thank you, Anita. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, all the patriarchs were buried in the famous cave at Machpelah, which was Abraham's first purchase in the Promised Land mm-hmm. that he bought from the Hittites. First piece of real estate in, in the Promised Land is a grave site. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're all buried there except Rachel, who died in childbirth en route as they were journeying toward Bethel, and she died near Bethlehem. So she was buried there mm-hmm. on, on the road. Um, yeah. So uh, she, she died in an untimely way. But I think it's, it's also interesting that um, only the first wife, wife, the first wife of each patriarch is buried with him there in the family tomb. Maybe it's a subtle hint that marrying two women is contrary to God's plan. Mm-hmm. Polygamy mm-hmm. is contrary to God's plan for marriage, the original covenant that he established between Adam and Eve. You know, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. Marriage is meant to be monogamous, faithful, a, a complete self-giving, and that's not compatible with polygamy. Yeah. So it's not that they were immoral according to the, the moral understanding of the time. You know, God allowed for that human weakness. But I think it is interesting that only the first wife of each patriarch is buried w- with him in the family mm-hmm. tomb. Steve asked the question, do you think God would have worked through Jacob no matter what? Or was it essential that Jacob take the birthright from Esau and steal his blessing? So I think he's asking, <laughs> do you really need to go through all of that? Couldn't God just said, okay, I'm going to work through you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like saying, um, does God need our crooked lines? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, God doesn't need our crooked lines. Um, we can't limit God's wisdom and, and power. He, he will bring about his purposes in whatever way he needs to, working with our free will mm-hmm. and all of the concrete circumstances of our lives. But no, he didn't need Jacob's deception and trickery and scheming, d- dishonesty um, toward his father and toward his brother in order to carry out his plan. If Jacob had trusted God and been faithful, God would have had another way of bringing it about. But we see God's infinite provision that he is able to work even with our crooked lines. Thank God. Yes. <laughs> and for, for us today. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. You know, they, they think, well, I've screwed up. I messed up my life. I made a, you know, a big mess out of my, my family or whatever. Can God use me at all anymore? Is there a place for me? And as long as you got breath, 
I think there's always right. a place. There's That's always right. the mercy of God and forgiveness. Yep. And he's the God of second chances. That's right. In my case, third chances. Fifteenth. <laughs> Fifteen <laughs> chance. Right. Ten thousand. Okay, Courtney, uh, why did Jacob decide to bless his second grandson rather than the first? Did it have anything to do with his own father's blessing? Well, it, it, it may have because we, we certainly see that pattern run throughout yeah. Genesis. God continually overturning, upturning human status by choosing the less favored or the less uh, of, of lesser status, choosing the younger brother. But um, it doesn't show that in Genesis. It just says um, Joseph brought his sons to be blessed by their grandfather, Jacob, and um, and, and Jacob's old and, and not seeing so well at, at that point, crosses his arms and he puts his right arm, the arm of greater blessing, on the head of the younger boy. And Joseph tries to reverse it. He, he, he tries to you know, move his arms back. No, don't, Dad, that's, that's wrong. Don't do it that way. Which is ironic because Joseph is a younger son himself, right? Yeah. He's, he's the guy who dreamed of older sons bowing down to him. But anyway, he, he tries to reverse it and Jacob says, not so, my son. So you get a sense that um, he's, he's becoming pr- prophetic at the end of his life. In, in the blessing of the 12 sons, he, he, he sees into the future. Mm-hmm. And he is seeing into the future of the two sons of Joseph. And he's foreseeing the greater blessing for the younger, Ephraim. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, it's not that he's saying, oh, okay, this is the pattern, so now we have to do it this way every time. It's more... God has shown me this is the way I am to do it this time. Yeah. And just to go forward and fill that all out, uh, Joseph had two sons, uh, Ephraim, Ephraim and, and Manasseh. And when you see, you open up your Bible and you look at a map, you don't see property for Joseph. You don't right. see the tribe of Joseph. You see what are called half tribes, uh, mm-hmm. Ephraim and Manasseh. Mm-hmm. And Ephraim, is, Ephraim is, is, plays a very important role. Because in 930 BC, when the kingdom divides into two nations, it's going to divide along these lines mm-hmm. where you're going to have Judah to the south and Ephraim to the, the north, and Jeroboam is an Ephraimite. Yeah. And he yeah. comes up with the idea of, well, let's create some bulls, you know, one at Bethel mm-hmm. and one at Dan. Well, where'd you get that idea from? It's kind of in the blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so these two, these two sons are uh, of Joseph do have roles in the future of Israel, but a lot of people don't even know that that Ephraim and Manasseh are sons of Joseph. You yeah. just wonder why are those names in there? You know? Yeah, and Ephraim becomes the most numerous tribe other yeah. than Judah, and yep. the name Ephraim even becomes like a synonym for Israel. Yes. So blessed is that tribe. Yeah. Yeah, very good. This has been so fun with you. <laughs> yeah, it sure it really has. It's it's fun when you get together with uh, other people that are really interested in Scripture. And you literally could go all day long just talking about more and more. And that's one of the, the things that's fun about going to a conference sometimes is you meet up with all your friends who are studying and everyone's kind of sharing what they found recently. And, yeah. and the deposit of faith, or I guess a personal deposit of faith, personal treasury of all that you learn in Scripture just yeah. gets bigger and bigger. I get new nuggets every time I talk to you. Yeah, well, it's fun. <laughs> Gold it, nuggets. Yeah, it's, it's fun. It re- really, really is. Would you mind closing us all out with prayer? Sure, yeah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your holy word in which you still speak to us as a loving Father today. Your word, which is a two-edged sword, that truly does pierce us, that convicts us, encourages us, consoles us, counsels us. Father, I pray for everybody watching and listening to this that you would enkindle in them a holy hunger to study your word and to dive into it, to know it and to live it, to to be attentive to it, to believe it, and to obey it. And Father, we pray that um, you would bring that word to life by your Holy Spirit. Only your Holy Spirit can give breath to your word that, that makes it into that now word 
that changes our lives. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon us and open up the eyes of our heart. Give us revelation, Lord, so that your word will truly transform our lives. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you for watching. If you would like to see more amazing content on the Bible, be sure to like and subscribe.